All right, let's go ahead and kick it off. So welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We'll be talking about the future of B2B buying, both the trends side of it and then tactics you can take to address those trends. I'm Aaron Perry. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer here at Data. I oversee our consulting team. I lead Data's marketing, work tightly with our sales team to do a lot of the things we'll be talking about today. And then I'm also a buyer myself. So at Data, I have been on many of the buying groups for some of our largest purchasing decisions. So today I'm coming at this kind of with two perspectives, both that of someone who tries to sell things and as a buyer who tries to navigate the messy landscape of all the people trying to sell those things. And then I'd like to introduce Mike. Uh, Mike is here today. And Mike, why don't you tell us about a little bit about yourself? Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Data, for allowing me to present with you, Aaron. I always appreciate it. Uh, Mike Monum with Sales Acceleration. I'm an outsourced fractional VP of sales, which means that I work with a few different companies at a same time, giving them all a fraction of my time and, and, and ability, helping them with their sales process, helping them with generating some ROI and working with them on their sales plan, sales process to help identify that. We're going to be going over a lot of fun stuff today, a very interactive approach to the topics that we're going over. Look forward to presenting. The couple of things that we're going to be going over today, just is trends and, and tactics, creating that brand awareness, building buyer enablement, and becoming a sense maker, and kind of a fun topic that, that we've come up inside of that, identifying that, that sense maker is probably my favorite part of it. All right, and we'll get started by talking about your buyer today. When it comes to buyers today, we're seeing kind of two big trends that really define changes in the marketplace. One is a demographic shift. So as the boomer generation retires out of the workforce, what we're seeing is the Gen X and millennials make up over 90% of professional buyers in many industries. And this change in demographics gives rise to a change in how buyers want to interact throughout the buying process. And you, one way to think about this is the changes that happen in B2C purchasing and buying, B2B generally lags about anecdotally, I'd say five to 10 years behind that. So what we're talking about today, for instance, the automobile industry has already been through, evolved through, and had to change to adapt to these buyers. On the B2B side, we're a little slower, but the demographic change is here and we have to adapt. The other big change is the makeup and complexity of buying groups. And essentially business has gotten more complex in every single direction. There's more solutions on the market than ever. There's more complex needs organizationally than ever. And that has given rise to much larger buying groups of people. The average group is now five to 11 stakeholders. And those aren't stakeholders that are necessarily all immediately impacted by the solution they're seeking. They are coming together from all different avenues of the business, working together to pick a solution that's not only going to meet one group's needs, but satisfy a bunch of different stakeholders at once. And Mike, is this what you're seeing with your customers in terms of how their demographics for buyers are changing? It really is. And with that change over from generation to generation, not just within a family business, but within the others, just as we talked about boomers retiring, Gen Z, millennial or Gen X and millennials coming up through that, there is going to be a lot of transition and a lot of new documentation, a lot of new research that, that gets put into it just through that. How do we help to minimize that? How do we help provide the uh, pathway to get beyond that and, and get to the decision-making process. So no, it's uh, right now is probably the best time to be talking about it. A lot of changes that are going on right now, 75% of buyers that are out there in today's market prefer a rep-free sales experience, which me as a sales professional, eh, hate to hear that. The next point brings it back to validation, but buyers who made that digital self-service purchase are 1.6 times more than 1.6 times more likely to regret it. A little bit of buyer's remorse. Maybe if you want to think about an Amazon purchase, we just looked at the, the five stars. We didn't really read some of the two and three star reviews in between. Maybe looked at some incorrect information that was out there or didn't have the right subject matter expert to help with that. Making sure that you can be of a value add source 
working with your contacts and being in front of an RFQ or an RFP process is really what helps within making those decisions or helping them make decisions in their world. Yeah, I think these stats really bring to light just how much behavior has changed. What I've heard historically from a lot of our customers is, oh, my customer doesn't read online reviews. Oh, my customer just picks up the phone and calls me or, oh, Mm -hmm. my customers find me through word of mouth. And the data is out there. That's not necessarily the behavior we see anymore. Um, Buyers rely on their own research. They use many different sources and vendor materials are at the end of the list when it comes to the impact those resources have on their decision. So prior experience, referrals, consultant recommendation, user reviews, um, all of that carry a lot of weight with today's buyers. And they're seeking these resources out well before they talk to a salesperson. There's been a dramatic shift in the buyer journey in terms of when a sales rep actually gets asked or invited into that customer's research. Mike, we're also seeing much bigger groups again. Yeah. Instead of making a path of resistance, understanding that buyer journey, we'll dig into this a little bit further, as you'll see with a similar slide. But there are so many different jobs within the decision-making process from that problem identification, solution exploration. And if you're not getting some inputs throughout this journey, where does that next decision come from? Again, I'll talk about this a little bit later on, but do you have permission to move forward within your solutioning? Did you just come to the table and throw everything out that you had for information? Or was it part of a process and evaluation and a presentation in in terms of coming up with that best information. But there's so much information that's coming to our buyers today. Yeah. And when we we think about the size of that group, they've got these six jobs. These are the six jobs that Gartner's identified as the jobs that buying group needs to complete. And because that group is so large and diverse, each of them probably has a slightly different perspective on, let's say, requirement building or supplier selection. It's complexity times complexity equals complexity squared. One of my favorite slides, just so much information here. And in an old world, it it looks like a pathways to get something through a a, a UL approval, if you're familiar with that whatsoever, but it's a unique path. Uh, There's so many different things going on, just as far as the amount of information that our buyers are getting. Who is it coming from? When is it coming? How often are they getting? How much more? Um, information do you want to get from it? 44% struggle with the fact that the information from various suppliers, again, just an overload of information from where you start to the information you need to gather in between and how do you lump it together? And if you're not using other trusted sources uh, that have been through this before, how do you start to make that that decision? It's it's a long, slippery slope. It's a steep one when you start really layering in all of the subsequent information gathering process in making that decision. How do we as buyers and marketers really start to narrow this down? Yeah, when we talk about a user journey, we like to think about it like we think of our pipeline stages. We want to think, oh, they go through A, they go through B, they go through C, they go through D. And what this research goes to show is, yeah, they go A and then they go B and then they go back to A and then they jump to C and then they go back to B. And it's this very convoluted, reoccurring cycle of activity. And at every stage, those buyers are getting more information and more data. And they think that's a good thing because they want more data to inform their decision. But unfortunately, the inevitable result is overwhelm. There's just too much information out there. There's too much complexity. And when we're overloaded, whether we're an individual or a buying group, we have basically three responses. One is that we choose not to make a change at all. We drop out of the buyer's journey and we stick with what we have because the pain of going through that journey is greater than what we believe the return on that journey will be. Um, So obviously as salespeople, we don't like that answer. Number two is we respond to overload by choosing heuristically, which means we take a mental shortcut and we go with the brand that we know about. Um, Most of us have an idea of who can solve our problem before we do any research. 90% of the time, that's the list we choose from. It goes back, if you want to go back a decade or more, the joke used to be, hey, nobody gets fired by an IBM. That's still true today where brand recognition often wins out over doing the hard work of figuring out who's the best fit for us. And then finally, the third, and the one that gives us salespeople hope, 
is that people will choose the vendor who helps them make sense of this mess on this slide, someone who helps them put this information into context. So those are the three responses people are going to take when overload inevitably hits as a result of these buyer sizes. So what are we supposed to do as B2B sellers? There's essentially three approaches that we need to understand and capture with our sales and marketing. Number one is we need to create brand awareness. The reality is there is a short list for our buyers. You're more likely to get chosen if you're on that short list. So how do we get on the short list? How do we make our name synonymous with their problem? Number two is building buyer enablement. The customer is not always right, but the customer should get what the customer wants. And what the customer wants in this case is the ability to do their own research. So we need to meet them where they're at and we need to give them the ability to get through those six jobs as much on their own as possible. Eventually they do need to talk to us. We don't want them to walk away unsatisfied and choosing the wrong decision, but we can't fight the fact that consumer behavior has changed and that salespeople are getting involved lower and lower down that funnel. We just need to, we need to meet those needs with marketing and sales. And then third, we need to evolve to become not just solution salespeople, uh, not even just challenger salespeople, but sense makers. And that means that we don't just educate them on why our solution is best for them, but we help them take all of that data and information that they've gathered throughout this journey, and we help them put it into context, and we guide them through how to make that decision. Um, so these three things is what Mike and I will cover throughout the rest of our presentation today, and we'll jump right in. Kicking it off and part of your sales approach, this slide is uh, gathered out some information from sales acceleration from some assessments that we send out from over 3,686 assessments in 2022 that ask some specific questions. But 54% of small to medium-sized businesses don't have a value proposition which means that sales team isn't hitting on all the same targets. The marketing isn't sending out that same messaging uh, from ownership to finance to operations and shipping. Everybody's not talking about the same things in a way that should be. It doesn't mean that it's negative. It's just it isn't in a consistent path. 73% don't know what makes their company unique. Then you might just be selling off of the cheapest price. So again, having understanding what that is only elevates what that value should be worth. 57% of companies don't know their competitors. If you don't know what makes you unique or how it's different from your competitors, then part of your value prop should be, let me introduce you to some of my competitors as well. Having all three of these line up is how you get in front of that decision-making process. Aaron, what do you guys see on that? We see the same issue. Sometimes it's that the business has maybe not made some hard decisions that lead to having a concrete unique value proposition. More often though, I'd say that you, you can tell that it's there and they just haven't vocalized and cemented it. But for us, this is always a place we start with our customers yeah. because unless you have a really solid value proposition, you don't have anything to build a brand story off of. And then you don't have anything to build brand awareness off of. We could put millions of dollars towards brand awareness, but unless you have a unique value proposition that drives that brand awareness, it's just going to be more noise on the market. Even from blogs and posts and anything like you might do from a marketing standpoint, it all starts with this initially. Yeah. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this, but this is one way to identify that value proposition called the onlyness test. There's a lot of options out there on how you can get at a unique value proposition, but I'd stress the unique part. We have a tendency as marketers and as salespeople to want to do more, and sometimes less is more powerful, less is more unique, and less will resonate in the mind of the consumer better. Um, and once you do have that unique value proposition hammered down, which I don't want to make light of it, that is an effort in itself, um, that's when we can actually start to get on the short list. And that's when it comes down to how do we build trust and credibility with the prospect, ideally before they have a need. Once they have a need, they're in research mode. They've already got a short list. In order to get on that short list, we have to really understand who we're targeting and get in front of them. We need to be consistent. The data shows it takes about seven to 10 touch points, which includes marketing and sales, before a customer trusts you. And if you're not consistent, 
they may not link those touch points together. So your brand needs to show up the same way everywhere. Your logo needs to be the same. You can't have 15 taglines. I'm sorry. Presence, you do need to get out there. We see this sometimes where someone has a great brand, but they literally just mm -hmm. have it on their building and on their website, and then they're not doing any promotional activity. So you need to understand where are your customers? How do you get in front of them? Whether that's media placement or some other type of activity. And backing under all of this, you do need to have a brand story that's compelling to your target audience. Uh, but this is how you get on a short list. It all starts with value proposition. Mike, anything you want to add to this slide? We were chatting about this earlier. And my point was you can train a goldfish to come to the back right corner of a round bowl if you feed them the right food and put it into the same spot every time. That's your brand. That's your messaging. And that's your style that you're you're putting out there. So uh, I'm not saying that we're goldfish. What I'm saying is that we also have to do it in this marketplace. So no, it's you're definitely right. You can have that greatest information. If you don't talk about it, if you don't get it out there, if you don't post it, and if you don't work within those referral circles, what do you have? Um, and to that point, you have to understand your customer. Yep. So putting together really and building that, that second phase of your unique selling proposition, the, there's three big points that are out to the organization, the teams, and the individuals, and understanding where what makes them up, that demographic, the age, the gender, the income, education level, occupation. We've got to understand that from a foundation. Psychographics, where do they hang out? What do they like? Where, where are they at in terms of it? What are some of those purchasing behaviors? What have they bought in the past? What are some of the uh, brand loyalty stuff? Are they just sticking with the incumbent or have they found out some other stuff in the past and, and done some other research? Needs and pain points is probably the most important thing. What problems are we solving? If we don't start to have that in the creation of our items, you really don't have much of a, of a product or a solution whatsoever. And the prior work falls to the wayside. And then understanding that competition. These are all things that fall into that, that, that side of it in terms of understanding what those behaviors are, where they live, where we coexist in that same and how you can solve that. That's the basis of that solutioning. Yeah. So narrowing down your ICP and being really firm on who the best fitter for you is essential to being a modern sales organization. Also essential to that. And just for the sake of time, I'm not going to go through these one by one, but you do need to understand the composition and the roles that go into forming a buying group. You generally have all four of these present. They all have slightly different perspectives, slightly different needs from a salesperson. And as we're talking about building buyer enablement, Understanding these different roles and how they interact with you through the marketing and sales process is going to be critical to building that buyer enablement, those tools that you're going to equip the customer with. Yeah. You saw this one before, and really it was identifying those stages that they're going through with that from problem uh, identification, requirements, validation to consensus. Are they agreeing on the decision, which is to purchase your product at the end? Putting those into the stages, defining what it looks like, having those permissions to move forward with problem identification. We've identified it. We've created a, the, the steps necessary to get through to the next point. Now do we have your permissions to move on to your solution exploration, building requirements? We can name them whatever we want. These are what Gartner identified as those most common segments within solving those problems. So if you don't understand these, we haven't done our work ahead of time to get the rest of it done. Yeah, we really have to understand how do we help that group do yeah. these jobs? And yeah. the more we can give them self-service options, uh, the stronger we'll stand out as being a helper to them. And then finally, the thing we need to do is become a sense maker, which means helping them do their job. So Gartner's identified three basic approaches to how people sell to a customer. The first one is just giving more information, which is putting more coal on the fire in this case. We already have a complexity issue. Yes, you need to get your buyer information, um, but don't give them information for the sake of giving them another white paper. That's not going to be what closes the deal. Yeah. Another approach is being a little prescriptive and telling them this is what you need because I know. And that doesn't generally build trust. That feels a little shallow and everybody knows that you're going to recommend your own solution at the end of the day. That's your job. The third approach that's what a modern sales organization needs to embody 
is this sense-making approach, which is saying, hey, yes, it's a vast, complicated landscape and you have a ton of information. Let me put that into context for you. Let me tell you why my competitor is good for this group of people and why I'm good for this group of people and how our solution is built differently. Mm -hmm. um, it's simplifying, not adding more complexity. Mike, I think you have some specific advice on how to think about that. Yeah, this is a fun slide and, and something to consider that phase three of what we're, we're now becoming that sense maker. And this is what we do. We may have done this a hundred times within the last month. It's our buyer's first time going through this solution. And we're there as the expert to help them make a choice in the options that they've got in front of them. What we're doing is we're, we're allowing them to, to make that decision on their own based on the criteria that we've gotten, but we've helped get them that right information in between. And again, identifying those steps, removing the paths of resistance to get there, giving them the correct, credible information and showing them the results and validation of what happens when we do that. Sorry, I fumbled there. <laughs> oh, no, worries. I think this slide is really about how do you create that clarity and understanding, which to your point, you've helped people make this decision over and over again. It's less about telling them to make the decision and choose you. It's about telling them what they need to know along the way as they make those decisions. Yeah. What are the pitfalls customers fall into and why? What are the things they're not considering that they should be? And again, why is a competitor potentially a good fit for them or potentially a bad fit for them? Yeah. And then finally, giving those customers a way to verify your word that's not just your marketing materials, but potentially connecting them with another customer who's been through that journey. Um, at the end of the day, it really boils down to three fundamental things, which is knowing who you are, having that value proposition locked in and understanding what makes you unique among your competitors. It's knowing who your best fit is, who that unique attribute is should attract the most and who has, should get the greatest value from it, which means saying no to some customers and not everyone's going to be a perfect fit and we have to be okay with that. Yeah. And it's being honest and upfront about both of these points. One of my favorite things to do as a buyer is to ask a prospective vendor about their competition. And if they can't tell me some strong points about their competition, I know that I maybe can't trust their advice as well as I'd like to. Yeah. Um, it's the buyer will make the best choice if you equip them to make the best choice and you should trust them to do that and equip them to do that. Yeah. Does that line up with what you're seeing in your clients, Mike? The ones who are It is so true with that. Again, it's, it's giving that information and yeah, you can't be a perfect fit for all of them, but if we can click the majority of the boxes to fill what they're looking for in, in the best possible way, that's a home run. And we're going to do the best job that we can to be 100% best for them. But it, it's okay if we're not perfect for them, but understanding that I might need some help on part of this from some of it, uh, from another source. Understanding your strengths, your weakness, but knowing that upfront is how you build your pricing. It's how you build your validation and how you build your this part of that decision-making with them at the end. You're not telling them, this is your only decision. Here's a couple. Here's what we can do different. Here's why it's different. Here's why I think this solution is custom fit better for you. Yeah. So I know we ran through a lot very quickly today. We'll make sure to share these slides and this recording with everyone who registered. But just to quickly recap, so buyer demographics have changed. Millennials are making a lot of those decisions now, and they have different habits and different ways of approaching this. Buyer groups have gotten bigger. They're more complex. There's more people in the room with different opinions and different motivations that need to be understood. And at the end of the day, the three top things you can do to evolve your sales and marketing to meet this changing face of buyers today is become that top choice by building and achieving strong brand awareness. Meet buyers where they're at by building out buyer enablement that helps them complete those six sales jobs and help them do their job once they do talk to you by being a sense maker, not giving a prescription, but helping them understand the choices they're making and putting them into context. If you can get these three things right, I think I'm pretty confident in saying you'll be ahead of the pack as a small to medium sized business. This is hard stuff. I don't want to make light of it, but doing it right is important. Yep. But thank you all for joining us today. 
Thank you. It's been our pleasure. And we will be sending out this recording, these slides. And then if you're a current data customer, uh, your pod would be happy to talk to you about each of these steps. If you're not a current data customer or a current sales acceleration customer, both Mike and I would be happy to talk to you about how your organization can achieve some of these outcomes.